Welcome to the new Muslim Tate. Andrew Tate, who was once the most Googled man on the planet, reverted to Islam back in 2022. Even before his reversion, Andrew Tate had a massive online following of Muslims, but his Muslim fan base grew exponentially after his reversion to Islam. Although most Muslims were happy about his reversion, many Muslims, including some scholars of Islam, have been very critical about some of his controversial views on many issues, including masculinity. I'm saying you can't sit as a man and afford the luxury of saying, I have a mental health issue today, I'm sad today, I'm stressed today, I'm emotional today, I can't work. Tate often denigrates displays of vulnerability or emotional expression in men, suggesting that any display of vulnerability or emotion is weak or unmanly. Weak men are always destructive. Weak men are emotionally led. They're not particularly stoic. They're impulsive. Cry when you want to cry. He discourages men from showing any signs of weakness or sensitivity, which many Muslim scholars claim is contrary to the prophetic way. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is considered by Muslims as the most masculine yet emotional human being to walk the face of this earth. And the dangerous thing about overly emotional men is that they're dangerous. They're genuinely dangerous. This is what's crazy. And I argue that point absolutely. I think the most dangerous men on earth are the weak men. Tate frequently promotes the idea that men must assert dominance over others, particularly in competitive or confrontational situations. He often equates success with dominance and portrays it as a necessary trait for all men. Well, if you're a weak man and you're going through life and you don't have the strength and resilience to resist the trials and tribulations of being a man and you're constantly hurt by everything and you're constantly upset and depressed and sad because you're weak, how could you possibly do good? It is noteworthy that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him saw goodness in both strong and weak men. In an authentic narration, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, The strong believer is more beloved to Allah than the weak believer, but there is goodness in both of them. Many Muslims claim that Tate places significant importance on physical strength and appearance, often suggesting that a man's worth is tied to his muscularity and physical prowess. First, you want to become as strong as physically possible. This, many believe, can lead to body image issues among his younger Muslim followers. Furthermore, his emphasis on wealth, luxury, and material possessions as markers of success reinforces a narrow and superficial definition of masculinity and is contrary to Islamic teachings. If you try and you make it to the top, you end up elitist because you look at the people down below and you're like, well, why didn't you try? I did. Oh, I did too. No, you didn't. didn't. That's a lie. Mm. Now you're lying to me and that annoys me. And now I have all this money. But if I meet somebody who's truly broke, truly broke, I'm not talking about you not have hundreds of millions, but if I meet somebody who's broke, I think they're an idiot. How are you poor? You're, you're lazy. There's only three reasons you can't get rich in the world today, which is either you're stupid, you're lazy, or you're arrogant. I think most normal people understand if you were to ask them how is the economy, they'd say, well, it's impossible. I can't pay for my bills. I can't pay to eat. I can't afford a house. I can barely afford my mortgage. I'm never going to get rich this way. They understand all of this, but they're not panicking. Mm. Why are you not panicking? The, the Titanic just hit the iceberg. You may not be in the water yet, but it's a certainty. There's nowhere else to go. Panic now. Don't panic at the end with everyone else as they go into the icy depths. No. A true Muslim should only panic if his or her relationship with God has taken a hit. As the only iceberg that every Muslim and every human being alive can never escape is their meeting with their Lord. What's really sad is that it seems like Andrew Tate still holds most of these controversial views in high regard. Even after being a Muslim for two years, Tate's repetition of such un-Islamic views, even at this point of his life journey as a Muslim has become a major talking point among many Muslim scholars due to some of the bad influences Andrew Tate can have on young Muslim minds. In the following clip, we see Dr. Yasser Qadi correcting Andrew Tate and his likes on the wrong understanding they have about masculinity and what real masculinity looks like according to the Quran and prophetic narrations. The Quran makes a distinction between being a male and being a man. Not every male lives up to being a praiseworthy masculine man. Let us look at the Quran and derive from the Quran what the Quran describes as positive masculinity, healthy masculinity. An example of where Allah praises masculinity in the Quran is Surah Yusuf when Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ Every prophet we sent before you was of the rijal. They displayed masculinity. Every prophet before you acted like a man should act. Every prophet displayed masculine traits. What are some of these characteristics that Allah praises. Number one, Allah praises, Min al 
of the believers are men who have fulfilled what they promised Allah they would do to defend the Prophet to death to defend Islam even if their lives were lost and Allah praises the martyrs of Badr and Uhud Allah praises the martyrs of Khandaq and Allah says there are those they made a promise to Allah and they acted like a man to fulfill that promise and some of them even passed away and became shuhada when they fulfilled that promise so the first characteristic in our list today is bravery to the point of losing one's life in the defense of one's family and faith and religion of the believers are real men they made a promise they said they would fight to death and they fought to death and Allah praised them for that commitment. Another that the Quran mentions in Surah At-Tawbah, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, "Lamasjidun usis ala taqwa min awwal yawmin ahqqu an taquma fi." As you know, there was a controversy amongst the munafiqun who created another masjid and the Prophet was forbidden to pray in that masjid. It was told in the Quran, "If you're going to pray, then pray in Masjid Quba. Don't pray over there." That masjid that was built upon taqwa, Allah says, "Fihi rijalun yuhibbuna an yatatahharu." In that masjid are men. Ya Rasulullah, don't go to the other masjid. That masjid, they might be males, but they're not men. You should go to the masjid of men. So why is the masjid of the munafiqun criticized? The implication, they're not masculine. You should go to the masjid of real men. So what was the other group doing? Hypocrites, conniving, lying, double crossing. You're not acting like a man. You're not a gentleman. And as for the people of Quba, they were gentlemen. They were fulfilling their covenants. They were worshiping Allah. They were constant in their prayer. So Allah said in masjid Quba, they are the real men. And then Allah mentions, Fihi rijalun there are people who love to purify themselves before coming to pray. This is an interesting characteristic of a man. Allah says, basically, the men are those who are following the sharia down to the smallest detail. They're making sure they do wudu properly because the people of Quba were praised for doing wudu every time they come to the masjid. Even if they had wudu, they would do wudu. So they're demonstrating piety to the small issues. And Allah says, this is manhood. Another example in the Quran, Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi buyutin adina Allah an turfa'a wa yudhkara fiha ismuhu yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghuduwi wal asali hu rijal men are those who are always coming to the masjid and leaving their businesses when it's time to pray and preferring the prayer of Allah and the dhikr of Allah when it's time to pray over their businesses and without a doubt Allah is using the term rijal the same way that we would say in English to one another be a man that's literally what Allah is saying these are men and then Allah says men fear none but Allah Allah, this is masculinity. Another verse that praises manhood. A man came running from the other side of town. Allah calls him a man. What characterizes that man? Bravery. To stand up against his people. To stand up for the truth at great cost. So much so he's killed. And Allah calls him a man. That's that man who enters Jannah. Why does he enter Jannah? Because in his bravery, he stood up and he spoke the truth. And he said to the people, I'm telling you to follow the prophets. I'm telling you, they're speaking the truth. He was a nobleman of his own town. And the townspeople felt betrayed when one of their leaders says, follow the prophets of Allah. And they started ganging up on him. And they started beating him up until they ended up killing him. And Allah called him a man. So notice here. In all of these verses, sorry to be blunt here. Number one, there's no notion of going to the gym and having big biceps. Not that going to the gym is wrong. Don't get me wrong here. There's no question physical strength is overall positive. Don't misunderstand me. But fact of the matter, toxic masculinity prioritizes physical strength. Whereas the Quran is exclusive about spiritual strength. Toxic masculinity is obsessed with the physical. Oh man, if you cannot wake up and pray Fajr in the masjid, you're not a man. It's as simple as that. You can go to the gym 10 hours a day. If in your heart you're scared of the cancel culture, you're scared of what people will say, by the testimony of the Quran, your biceps can be, I don't know, 40 inches, whatever it is, you are not a man. Real men are not worried about the gossip of society. Real men only fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to do that, you don't need biceps. You need strength of the qalb. Notice, by the way, in all of these verses, real manhood is not 
being contrasted with women is being contrasted with men who don't live up to real manhood. A real man is not competing against a woman. That's where toxic masculinity comes. You see, sisters and brothers, there is no war between the genders as feminists want you to believe. We don't believe there is one. The Sharia doesn't posit one. There is no battle. We're on the same team. What then is toxic masculinity? In my humble opinion, you can find a understanding of toxic masculinity that is blameworthy from the Sunnah. And that is in the famous incident, a group of women complained to the Prophet ﷺ that their husbands had abused them. Our husbands are physically abusing us. And the Prophet ﷺ called the people of Medina. He gave a khutbah, not on Jumu'ah. He gave a special khutbah. And he said in this morning, today, a number of ladies came complaining that their husbands abused them. These are not the best of your men. To me, this is an example of toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is obsessed with dominance. It wants to control the female. And it promotes the idea that a man should be aggressive in that notion of control. And in my humble opinion, the Quran and the Seerah is not about control. It is about leadership through respect and collaboration. The Quran talks about male leadership in a marriage. There's no question about this. Leadership is not the same as domination. And the Seerah teaches us that leadership comes not by raising your voice and screaming and shouting, but by earning the respect of your wife. Your wife genuinely respects you and gives you that authority because you have earned it by virtue of the fact you are acting the way a husband should act. The second point about toxic masculinity, I would say, is the overall rigidity when it comes to gender roles. That toxic masculinity wants to be super strict according to the letter of the law that they have read. And whatever they think a man should do, even down to the minutia of the list, of what a man or woman should do, they wish to enforce in their personal lives. Whereas healthy masculinity is flexible in understanding gender role, acknowledging that at times a man can be a caregiver to the children, at times a man can also do the chores of the household. But a toxic masculine trait, I'm never gonna do the dishes, I'm never gonna take care of the kids, as if you have to prove some list you've made in your head. Whereas real human beings understand sometimes we have to swap roles, not a problem. It doesn't hurt my manhood if I have to do what generally my wife does. And we find this in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Without a doubt, the default is that our mothers were the caretakers. Our mothers took charge of the home, without a doubt. Yet our Prophet ﷺ, we all know that he would also do his own chores. There's no hurt to your manhood. He would stand up and go milk the goat, which was considered a feminine task. He would go and get his own water, even though the cultural norms of the time were that the woman serviced the husband. But again, it doesn't hurt my manhood to be nice to my spouse. A third manifestation in example is the false notion of toxic masculinity that men should not display emotions that men should be stoic, that men cannot have feelings, cannot be hurt, cannot cry even. And this is patently false. The Prophet ﷺ cried multiple times in public. His son is dying in his hand and the tears are coming from his face. ﷺ. And even the Sahaba are like, you also cry? Because they hadn't usually seen him cry, right? But I mean, your son is dying in your hand, you're not gonna cry? I mean, there's a problem if at that stage you think your masculinity prevents you from shedding tears, then you have a serious problem. And that's what our Prophet ﷺ said, that crying is Allah's mercy He has placed in the hearts of His servants. Number four, the mechanisms of conflict resolution. When conflict happens, how do you resolve it? Toxic masculinity is done by flexing the muscles, literally and metaphorically. Raising the voice, giving commands, expecting blind obedience, shouting, threatening, divorce. If you don't do this, da da da. I challenge you to find one instance in the seerah in which the Prophet ﷺ said to his wives, if you don't do this, I'm gonna divorce you. It's not what a man does, constantly threatening your wife with a divorce. What type of marriage is gonna last like that? What type of bravery is that? How do you think a man, a real man, resolves conflict? Communication, talk, empathy, understanding, shura. Don't threaten, raise your voice. And without a doubt, a man is a leader in a marriage. I'm not gonna mince my words here. I don't care about political correctness. I believe in the Quran and I believe in biology and I believe in genuine, healthy masculinity and femininity. A man is the leader. A leader acts like one. And when he acts, acts like one, then those that should follow understand and they follow because he's earned the respect of those that need to follow. So conflict resolution
salvation is done from within because in the end of the day your wife is not your enemy she's on your team again the interesting incident of the seerah it is funny it is what it is where Abu Bakr as-Siddiq visited the house of Aisha radiallahu anha his daughter when the Prophet was there and he heard our mother Aisha raising her voice loudly rebuking getting angry and the Prophet is silent Abu Bakr radiallahu anh loses the temper and he barges in it's his daughter's house he barges in and he raises his hand to smack his own daughter and say how dare you raise your voice above the voice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are you not terrified Allah will punish you with an adab and as he raises his hand Aisha jumps up she doesn't know what to do she runs behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same one she's screaming at now she runs behind him and so the Prophet and raises himself up to physically protect his wife when they're having an argument and now some physical pain will come this is what you call a man this is a gentleman last point I'll mention is what I'll call perceptions of strength what it means to be strong how do toxic masculine people portray their strength and how does healthy masculinity portray their strength toxic masculinity is obsessed with physique to the point of it becoming narcissistic and again please don't misquote me I'm not saying being physically strong is unhealthy I am saying to be obsessed with the physical completely and ignore the spiritual is not Islamic masculinity and that is the default of masculinity of our times that's what I'm saying so I want to conclude on this point and that is that healthy masculinity and healthy femininity feed into each other in a positive synergy toxic femininity and toxic masculinity are at war with each other and no marriage will ever flourish if these two characteristics are found and society hurts when these two traits come out so we must be opposed to the toxic strands and embrace the positive and understand the strength of a man and the strength of a woman comes from totally different areas and the two of them are equally strong in the eyes of Allah if they claim what is rightfully theirs dear brothers and sisters in faith Please understand that this is not an attack against Andrew Tate, and we are not trying to imply that he is a bad Muslim, or that he does not love God. Only God can judge a man's heart. It appears that Tate truly loves God, and respects his newfound faith. Who the f Don't swear. Wrong. You need God. Revert to Islam and move to Saudi Arabia. But some of his controversial opinions that go against Islamic teachings and his negative influence on young Muslim minds needed to be addressed. May Allah guide Andrew Tate, in the entire Muslim nation.